I suppose I don't think of myself as a man, really. I think of myself more as an artist. And what surprises me about that whole thought, that whole idea of me as an artist, is how it started and how it evolved. Because I didn't understand, you know, how that happened. As a child, as a primary school child, let's say age 10 and so on, I became aware that of my attraction and how much I liked, let's say, drawing um, a map of Trinidad. I would love to draw them over and over and over. A map of, you know, that triangle of India or the belly of Africa, the culture in, in secondary schools more in some than in others and so on, was that the academically strong received the most applause, closely followed by, or on the same level as the athlete. Where is the artist in this? Where is he? You know, he's not there. So I had to go through school being aware that I am not meeting the, uh, that academic model thing or the athletic. I played some sport. I played cricket, football. Uh, and I, I went into the A stream up to sixth form. Average, not right. But all that time, I knew in my heart I didn't want to go into that intense academic world. Fortunately for me, I got a little scholarship here, and then another one to study art. So I, that, that saved me. You come back home, you're married, you start to have children. Wow, how am I going to do this art that I'm driven to do? I was a teacher because I recognized that teaching gave me the, the holidays. A couple of weeks at Christmas, week or two at Easter, six weeks in August. And from the time August came, I would say, right, let's go. Mayaro, we rent a house, let's go to a run. And we go in there and we spend a whole month painting, 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 painting. That's how I kept fighting this problem. But it was reaching a stage where I wanted to do it every day and I suddenly took this step in 1986. Unfortunately, it was around the time of an oil boom and people were starting to buy art and I was already building a little reputation in the art world. I said, you know what, I'm going to take the move and I retired, I resigned, whatever the word was. And you could imagine the first day, no salary, Wife, house, children, mortgage, car. And I come outside and say, what do I do now? I say, well, you get to work. <laughs> and that is how it went. The oil boom did help because a lot of people were buying art. And that sustained me. And I have lived through it. There, there are other little annoying things, of course like how people perceive artists. A fellow artist friend of mine, whose wife is a doctor, told me he was at a, a cocktail party with her, and somebody came up to him and said, well, Mr. So-and-so, um, what do you do? He said, well, I'm an artist. He said, no, no, what do you really do? <laughs> so, in other words, being an artist somehow is not real, you know? It's not useful. It's not, <laughs> which brings me to that whole thing about usefulness, a, a notion that something is only useful if, if you can see a tangible connection, financial or something, you know, is, is useful. But if you're producing art, how, how, 
How is that useful to society? Well, a, a, a cursory glance at the history of mankind from caveman art to now would, should answer that question easily. But, you know, people don't think that way. So you're constantly under that kind of pressure. I feel as though I'm driven. Once I'm experiencing things, once I'm seeing life, having experiences, and so on, I have to express my emotional responses to those phenomena. I have to express myself. So that keeps me driven, wanting to do. The second thing is not such a nice thing. It's that the, um, the feeling that whatever you are doing or have done is something approaching failure. So I have to do it better. I have to pursue it better. So, and that is something that pursues me. I can't speak for all artists. A sense of failure. And again, I'm going to refer to Walcott from time to time. He, he said something to me one day, and I think he was quoting from somebody. He says, an artist knows he's going to fail before he starts. You have this vision in your mind, inspired by your emotional response to what you're seeing around you, and you're going to put it down on paper or canvas. And then you put it down and you tell yourself, it's okay, mm -mm. not good enough, or nah, I could do better than that. And uh, when you have to live like that for decades, in my case, six decades, it's not a nice feeling, but it's a reality about being an artist that I accept. So that drives me to I'll do it better next time, <laughs> which of course doesn't happen. It has happened several times to me. It has happened today. I look back at some paintings I did in 1970. And I said, my God, what has happened? Why have I retrogressed? How come I can't paint as good as that? But at the time I was doing those, I was agonizing, no, I'm not getting this right. I'm not getting it right. The, 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 the resonance, the luminosity I'm looking for for the pain, I'm not getting it, I'm not getting it. 30, 40 years later, I look at those very paintings and say, wait a minute, I was doing very good work then. No satisfaction. And, and sometimes when you look back at a body of work, not individual pieces, I say to myself, well, you did, wow, this is a, a good body of work, but I'm so scared of falling into that trap of self-satisfaction that I move away from it quickly and I say, like, okay, let's move forward now. It is not so much a matter of how talented you are or how gifted you are, this and this. It's a matter of the discipline of working at it. That discipline. I think there's a line from a Latin poet, nulla dies sine linea, which I think means um, not a day without a line. It was probably a writer, a poet, who said, you know, in other words, every day I have to write a line. And to me, every day I have to produce, even if it's a little sketch, I have to do something every day. And it is only that discipline that would take me through to what I think and which never happens towards perfection. Because when I was a, a teenager, 1950-something, 60, um, and the art community was a much smaller one, the Changs and Ateks and, you know, Aladdins and people like that. And the 
critic at the time, at that time, actually was Walcott, who was knowledgeable, articulate, had a wide knowledge about art, history, of, and actually painted. So when he wrote, he wrote with a certain amount of sensitivity and precision and incisively and so on. At some point, slowly, that kind of quality reviewing and I'm not saying he was perfect or anything, you know. Vanished. And it has been replaced by newspapers asking people who are knowledgeable in literature to write about art with the assumption that you can transpose them. So, but it doesn't work so. Whenever I talk about my art, I make sure I talk about more technical things. I'm not going to say that my praise of traditional mass is important for the public. And I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say this is my tribute to traditional mass. You receive it. And I know as a child, standing up outside my front gate with my great aunt holding my hand, and hearing the Red Army Steel Band come up Sagwell Street, turn up Richmond Street, and so on. When you pan around the neck, of course, when you experience that in a childhood, it never leaves you. When you experience robbers making speeches and demanding money, and making speeches that you can hear because the technology with music was not there yet to draw out everything <laughs> within two blocks of it and so on. Those things stay with you. And I can't get it out of my mind. And I have exploited it and explored them, not just in sketches that literally depict them, but as metaphors in my work. So if I, you know, make a little allusion to a political situation and I use a robber, you know, I am simultaneously paying tribute to robber's traditional mass while making a social or political comment. And that has never left me. So the mass, the carnival, the steel band is all through my, my work. I'm certainly very conscious of the strong positive influence that men from time to time had on me. I mean, one was my father. He was a bit of a loner. He apparently was not always a loner. When he was a young man, before marriage and so on, he had a good guy and have a good time with the line and the fellas and so on. But once he was married, he was a loner. Um, and his focus was family. So there was that influence on me, the steady, disciplined man. Then there was Walcott, who was the art critic, early o'clock, obviously felt he saw something in my work, took an interest in me. And any time he was in Trinidad, up to when he died, you see, he would come here and he'd come inside here and look at my paintings and we would talk and he'd give me his, his, his very honest, because he, he didn't fool around with criticism. You don't care how good partner you would, no, 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 no. But he spoke like that. I don't see myself as a mentor. I'm not aware of that rule. But because of the, you know, the immense generosity that people like, um, as I say, my father Walcott, Sibyl Atek, um, Peter Menchel's father, who was a good critic to, to Peter and, and, and me when we were in, in our late teens, aspiring artists. Because of the kind of generosity, honest generosity they showed to us I never refuse 
any requests from a student or any young person who asks me to, to talk about their work or to give them advice or to answer questions. I never, ever refuse. Inspiration is a word I try to avoid because the popular notion of inspiration is some kind of mysterious, mystical thing that just happens. That is not my experience. I see inspiration as a much broader, bigger thing. Everything that I see happening, everything that I read, everything that I feel, everything that happens to me, everything that happens to the society, everything that happens in the world, that is where the inspiration is. It is not some strange, happy, mystical, emotional thing that you say, ah, I'll create today. Mm -mm. In fact, often when I wake up on a morning and I know I have to go to work, I find myself saying, I, I don't feel like, I don't feel like, but I go. I go, I potter around, I pick up the things, look here, look there. And eventually I begin. And to my surprise, often days like that is when I do better work. So it's not how I, whether I'm feeling inspired to work. Walcott says, you have a gift, but it's an exacting one. It's one that demands that you work at it, work at it, work at it for your entire life. And it's the discipline of work that does it. Thank you.